Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third day of apprenticeship webinars sponsored by the Houston Area Apprenticeship Advisory Committee. I am Sally K. Jane's Associate Vice Chancellor for Continuing and Professional Development at San Jacinto College, and I'm pleased to facilitate this advisory committee. The advisory committee includes ISDs, community colleges, and industry partners who have registered apprenticeships. We are so glad to see so many of you returning for another day of the field of web webinars filled with great information. To open our session today, I would like to introduce a good friend of mine and a great supporter and promoter of apprenticeships for the state of Texas. Desi Holmes was appointed in 2016 as the Apprenticeship Director at the Texas Workforce Commission. Her service at TWC and its pre predecessor agency, the Texas Employment Commission, spans 38 years. For the past 16 years, she has been involved in registered apprenticeships and Desi has administered state funds for TWC's apprenticeship training program which assist industries in developing and improving registered apprenticeships and other training programs designed to provide, <clears throat> excuse me, the skilled workers needed to compete in a global economy. Additionally, she has assumed a responsibility to implement TWC's Apprenticeship Texas plan to increase and expand registered apprenticeship training programs in Texas. Desi and her team have exceeded performance deliverables for the initial state apprenticeship expansion grant and expect to do the same for the current apprenticeship state expansion grants. Ms. Holmes has provided her expertise on statewide apprenticeship performance to the State Workforce Investment Council, Apprenticeship Training and Advisory Committee, and Apprenticeship and Training Association of Texas, and has developed and maintained successful relationships recognized by TWC, as well as apprenticeship program administrators. And I can certainly attest to that final statement. She is truly a good person to have a relationship with and does a super job with it. Desi, we welcome you to share your thoughts with us today. Well, Sally Kay, thank you for your gracious comments. They're very much appreciated. And I appreciate being invited to share a little bit of your time, with your group today. I believe we have a wide audience today and I want to try to give at least a couple of snippets of information about Texas Workforce Commission and the Apprenticeship Texas staff efforts um, to expand the awareness of registered apprenticeship. Um, and back in 2016, we were just a staff of one, me, and we have grown to, um, currently we have a staff of six, including me, and we have uh, an opening that we're posting for. So if we have any contract managers out there that want a different job, um, we're posting a job for that. Um, for those who have listened to several National Apprenticeship Week events, I don't want to repeat a lot of statistics to you, but I do want to set the stage for my short time with you today. Currently in Texas, there's approximately 550 registered apprenticeship programs, plus or minus two or three, that focus on both training and employing approximately 20,000 registered apprentices minus two or three, plus, minus, plus two or three. Yes, 20,000 apprentices are being trained for highly paid, highly skilled careers through registered apprenticeship while being employed. I'm going to touch on apprenticeship apprentices and encourage exploration of registered apprenticeship as a career pathway. Um, registered apprenticeships are career pathways that combine classroom training with paid and job learning. Registered apprentices, for the most part, are full-time paid employees. And in most cases, classroom training is very small financial burden, very rarely more than 500 per, per semester. Another important thing to discuss is registered apprenticeship is no longer 
the building trade, only building trades, such as plumbers, electricians, carpenters, millwrights. Although these are great careers and lead to very high salaries, as well as in some cases, the start of businesses for the individuals that complete the registered apprenticeship program in these industries and desire business ownership. Before you go, before I go to some of the apprenticeable occupations and salary ranges, I want to give you some perspective on college degrees and approximately entry level wages and maybe a couple of proximal college debt. And remember, I'm not the expert on this. I Googled this information. So you can, anybody can explore that. And I would hope anybody that's fixing to sign the check to the college explores it. So I'm gonna give you a few examples. I'm gonna start with like registered, uh, registered nurses. It's a four year bachelor's degree, estimated tuition and fees as much as $40,000 per year. And I'll put a plus behind that 40,000. I tried to go on the low end. Several testimonials online about student debt is 100,000 plus. And you could put plus, plus, plus. The approximately entry level salary is 41,000. Experience salary, approximately 94,000, a very admirable, well-paying occupation. Cybersecurity, it can be a bachelor's degree, associate's degree, um, an ever emerging um, occupation. Estimated tuition and fees range from 19,000 to 60,000 per year. It's usually a one to two um, year thing. Approximately entry, entry salary with degree, 64,000 experience salary with degree 90,000. Still good pay progression. A few examples of building trades. And you'll hear a little bit more about carpenters and millwrights later. I hear David Barron is gonna be following up with some of that information. But plumbers pipe fitters, usually a four to five year program, very comparable to what you'd expect to go to college for. Star starting wages, approximately 18 to $19. So you're looking at a starting wage of 38, 39,000 annually. Ending wages, approximately 33 to $34, putting you in the range over 70,000 annually. I would also point out that this doesn't all end in dirty jobs. For instance, plumbers, pipe fitters work in hospitals and have special credentials to work on medical gases. These specialty jobs can produce wages in excess of $100,000. Um, so it's the um, drive of the apprentice, the person training that drives how much salary that they will end at. Electricians, usually a four year training program, starting wage approximately 15 to $16, putting you at 33 to 34 annually. Ending wages approximately $30 an hour, putting you between 60 and 63,000 annually. Millwrights, usually a four year program. David, hopefully you don't have to correct me on that. Starting wages, approximately 15 to $16, 32,000 um, annually. Ending wages, approximately 30, 31,000, 64,000 to 65 annually. As mentioned above, the wages for plumbers have higher salaries with additional credentials. Electricians, millwrights, any of these occupations also have career pathways with additional credentials that carry their salaries higher than the ending journey worker that I spoke above. A few registered apprenticeships growing in other industries. Like I said, this isn't your grandpa's registered apprenticeship anymore. So cybersecurity, which is also a degree program can be a registered apprenticeship program. Starting salary without any ed education would be 16 to $17 or 34 to 35,000 annually. Ending wages, $30 um, an hour to 62, 63,000 a year. That registered apprenticeship can feed into business intelligence and data analyst. Starting wages in that occupation are 33,000 or you can be looking at 68 to 69,000. This occupation continues to grow in, in uh, competencies as you learn um, more and more. And it's a, and as you grow in those competencies, your salary is expected to grow to $51 an hour or over $100,000 annually. This position is scheduled to progress to $60 an hour 
or $124,000, depending on what competencies the individual wants to continue to attain. Industrial maintenance, system tech, that, that sounds pretty much like your grandpa's business, but it's not. It's, it's about maintenance of multi-million dollar copiers, copiers that fill a whole room and I'm not talking about a bathroom size, not one that you have in your office, not one you have in your school. They're multi-million dollar machines that produce um, lots of materials. Starting wages on that $16 or $33,000. It's about a two year program. You can progress up to almost $50,000 in those two years. This position is scheduled to be a $100,000 job um, with that company once they stop bringing in contractors. They're expecting to grow their own instead of continue to pay um, money to contractors. These salaries are being gained while learning and earning, and most importantly, not accruing educational debt. Now the apprentices might be accruing debt for the purchases of new cars and new houses based on their salaries, but not college debt. Next, I wanted to spend a few minutes on ways Texas Workforce Commission and my staff can assist with exploration of support for the development of registered apprenticeship training programs. TWC has another Apprenticeship Texas grant opportunity set to be released later this month for board, the eligible applicants will be boards, community, technical colleges, or consortiums of both, making available $10 million to support continued efforts to expand registered apprenticeship programs and newly registered apprentices. This amount being released is historic for Texas apprenticeship and probably historic nationally. We encourage employers looking to start and expand their apprenticeship programs to reach out to local workforce solution offices or their community and technical colleges to discuss possible project partnerships. Additionally, Texas Workforce Commission, there are three commissioners on Tuesday, November the 10th, in National Apprenticeship Week, approved another 3 million that will be released early 2021 to support the development of registered apprenticeship programs, specifically in information and technology. So Texas Workforce Commission is putting $13 million on the street to support registered apprenticeship. Again, this much funding is historic. Apprenticeship is growing opportunities in many industries, both old and new. Lastly, I'd like to share that Workforce Solutions Gulf Coast was announced as one of the 2020 Texas Workforce Commission Registered Apprenticeship Expansion Board Award winners for their continued efforts supporting the growth and awareness of registered apprenticeship. So I say congratulations to Gulf Coast. I also always say congratulations to San Jacinto College who has been such a wonderful partner with um, Texas Workforce Commission. Sally Kay has um, helped and was instrumental in doing the crosswalk that we talk about every time we're on the air, I think, about um, allowing registered apprenticeship to be articulated into college degrees with just a few classes to round out the degree. So I wanna say thank you for inviting me and um, I'll give you an email address if you need to reach out for additional information or I'm sure Sally Kay knows it by heart as well. She probably has my personal one, which I'll share you the Apprenticeship Texas cause it's easier to remember. Apprenticeship Texas, all one word, at twc.state.tx.us. Again, Apprenticeship Texas at twc.state.tx.us. Thank you, Sally Kay. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Desi. Uh, thank you, not just for your presentation today and, and sharing with everyone uh, what, what the opportunities are. We're showing them just a few this week, but you mentioned so many more that we can help them look into. So thank you for your presentation today, but thank you for your continued um, support of apprenticeships and, and your passion for what we are all striving for. Thank you. Call me anytime. I will, you know I will. <laughs> well, now as we move on and um, I'd like to introduce David Barron. 
Uh, David is the director of carpenter training for the Gulf Coast Carpenters and Millwrights Training Trust Fund. Um, David has been doing this for many, many years. He actually comes from um, the public school systems in the area and, uh, and others in Texas. So he knows what we're trying to do in terms of our high schools and as well as our colleges. So um, David, um, I know they're looking forward to what you have to show us today. Thank you. You're muted. Kimberly, can you unmute him? I'm trying, I have to ask him to unmute. David, go ahead and unmute your mic. Sorry, I, I moved everything over so I would be ready and I'll, and hid my unmute button from myself. No Good worries. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. James. I appreciate it very much. Um, as Dr. James said, I am a product of, of uh, public education, 23 years, 13 years in the classroom as a CTE teacher and 10 years as an administrator. My advice, don't go to the dark side, St stay on the teaching side. Um, for the last seven years, I've been uh, both the coordinator of a training center for the uh, Central South Carpenters and the uh, Southern States Millwrights, and then recently moved to a new position, um, taking care of both Texas and Louisiana. We have seven schools. For the next 45 minutes, I want to take a little bit of time. I want to show you a video which shows off our training center here in Houston. We have a training center in uh, Amarillo. We have one in Austin. We have one in San Antonio, Arlington and the one here as well. And then also we have one in New Orleans and we have one in Baton Rouge. So a student looking to go to school in any of those cities. And, and by the way, we're part of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters. We have 250 training centers across the United States and Canada, including our flagship training center that is a 1.3 million square foot center in Las Vegas. And yes, sadly, I have to go out there seven, eight, nine times a year when there isn't something called COVID around. So. Um, with that, let me start with, I'm very proud of this video. This video was produced by a CTE class uh, at the Dr. Lewis CTE campus here in Pasadena ISD. It was produced just a little over two years ago for our grand opening, but the kids did a fantastic job. So I'd like to start with that video. <laughs> Well, number one is I got many reactions, but my first reaction is how excited we are here in Pasadena to have a training center like this here. You know, when they first opened, the, um, the president and a bunch of the other executives we were talking to, and they said the most exciting thing I've ever heard, we don't want people with jobs. We want people with careers. And when you come here through these front doors with the training they have, they'll give you a career, and your career will last your, your whole life. But that's exactly what I was talking about. Students, as soon as they graduate high school, can come here for a career, and they'll train them, give them the education they need to have something the rest of their life. Here in Pasadena, we're growing with industry everywhere. If we don't have the workforce to supply, they'll go somewhere else. It's training centers like this. Our, our high school has training, and also sends us into college. All together, we can put the workforce to work right here in Pasadena. So the great thing about the Texas Carpenters and Millwrights is they invested immediately in the Pasadena Chamber. And so they joined at the platinum level and they're really looking to give back to the community um, and working with the city. And so when we have a partner like that, it's a win-win for everyone. So the future is looking good. And when companies like this choose Pasadena, um, it's a benefit for everybody. Well, look at what's happening here in Houston. You know, we just had Post Harvey, one of the worst things we've ever experienced. And Houston got it right. I mean, we're at, like I said, we're at 4% unemployment rate in Texas. And you're actually doing really good here in Houston. And to be able to provide various types of training to put people back to work. I know in Houston, there was a school that had the MC3 training model, 
which allowed folks to go through 120 hour training and literally put them back to work really quick. And so we learned from what happened in Louisiana and all we did was just follow the governor's 60 by 30 charge and providing folks with a certification and an associate degree if we had to. Uh, well, we're just real excited to be here. You know, we're excited about all the great things that are happening in Houston. The partnership that the folks have with not only industry, but also our apprenticeship schools, our ISDs, our community colleges. You know, it, what you're doing here in Houston should be replicated in other parts of the state. This training facility has been a dream for about five years, putting this together. We've had a, a lot of help with contractors, with the Texas uh, uh, Trust Fund, and General President McCarran with his vision about going on five years. It's all come together with this event tonight. It's going to be the premier training center in the Gulf Coast area. So we, we think very strongly that the market share will be increased by what we have here. People see the training, they can view it from the highway, and uh, we, we just think it's going to be a real plus for UBC. Well, the main thing is, is the education without any debt. So if you go through a four-year apprenticeship program, it's around a $20,000 uh, debt that you would have anywhere else. Here it's free. So you're on the job training, you're working, you're training, and when you get through your training, you become a journeyman, you don't owe anybody anything. Well, it, 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 yeah, it's actually, it's more than careers because our carpenters, millwrights, and everyone else, they have a, a, a physical toolbox. The second toolbox they have are qualifications and certifications, which is continuing education, which longer than a four-year apprenticeship program, our members in lifelong learning. We have more than 45 different qualifications and certifications, all which require a refresher every four years and are all, say, qualified and certified. So the more qualifications and certifications members have in their other toolbox, the more employable they are. So that they have a lot more skills than just the physical skills, they have other skills also. Well, the need is, the need for skilled craftsmen is very important. I mean, I, we, we like to say, hey, look, we, we train our people so they do it right the first time. Well, I, I just think, look, if you come in here and you get a good base of skills, you can have a career for 30, 35 years in the construction industry. Well, I just said the leadership of Jason Engels has really been key to the, the to the progress of this center. I mean, without Jason, this really wouldn't have happened. So this this grand opening, it's a 52,000 square foot training center for carpenters and millwrights to give young people, uh, people that, that are looking for a career in carpentry or, or millwright that works in industrial facilities primarily, you know, uh, warehouses with conveyors and things of that nature. It gives them an opportunity to have a career path for decent wages and, and a great retirement and health care for them and their family. All right. Well, again, a wonderful video produced by a great group. Um, Next, I'm going to take you on just a quick tour of the building and we're going to end up in a classroom. Um, we do a two week evaluation. If you think that this is a profession that you wanna pursue, we have a two week class that you come in and take, introduces you to the trade and this is on the carpenter side. Um, you'll do some classroom training. Yes, you're gonna do math. And then uh, from there you go on to uh, to working out in the shop. We've got projects that you build. At the end of that two weeks, you go through an evaluation process. And uh, through that evaluation process, you're invited into the program. So let me take you on a quick tour. I'm gonna switch over to a, a tablet that I have that's portable and we're gonna go down the way. In the meantime, uh, please be thinking of some questions. There's six uh, young men in that program that are being evaluated. Uh, I've already talked to them today, let them know we were coming into their, to their classroom. And then there's also one millwright uh, apprentice in that room I've asked to come over and join us. He is in the last, he is an eighth period apprentice. Uh, he has a possible uh, four year, uh, he's finishing up his four year apprenticeship program. Um, before we do that though, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to share with you. I'm very passionate about the apprenticeship program coming from the education realm, seeing the amount of debt that uh, I, I myself had, you know, and all of you that are educators, you understand that. 
and also the uh, the debt that we've seen our students rack up after they've left college. This is certainly one of those options. So if you'll you'll bear with me for just a second, let me uh, let me share my screen, and I'm going to uh, share with you a a uh, a PowerPoint. Come on, share with me here. Let me move this over where I need it, and uh, let me get it started, and we'll go from there. Come on, there it goes. So let me share this with you. So, well, and that's nice. Let's get it started again. Come on. All right. So again, uh, this is providing the alternate four-year degree for students. If you're thinking of, I want to, I want some additional training, but where do I go? Here, let me let me introduce you to this program. Um, what is a registered appro uh, apprentice, and what is the need for the? Are there a need for those programs? Registered apprentice combine uh, on the job training with classroom lab instruction. You know, one of the problems we have with college is if you're not a very good sit in a seat, you know, do do this. Uh, don't uh, don't vary out of that seat. Don't don't move around much. Then you you might be successful in a classroom. That's not our classrooms. Our classrooms are come to school, uh, spend a short time in your classroom, get out, go out to the shop, and do some work. Um, our contractors will never give you a written test. Although don't let me kid you, there are written tests, especially to go out into the plants that you must pass. But in a a, a contractor doesn't give you a written test, they send you to work. And, and if you can't perform, you failed that test. And we follow that example here. The, the majority of your grading comes from what you're able to produce. Um, apprenticeship programs are typically two to six years. Four to five is the average, uh, the most popular. We have two four-year programs here, a carpenter program, which is commercial and industrial carpentry. And then we all, and a millwright program, and we also have two three-year programs. One is strictly for the trade show industry, and the other one is for the scaffolding industry. When you finish an apprenticeship program, you are a journeyman, and you carry that from the Department of Labor, that you have that status as a journeyman. I could tell you the history of where that comes from, but we don't have time, so we'll have, you just have to look it up. Apprentice are paid a negotiated wage during the training period, and that, that helps separate out to some of the other types of training. In this type of training, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, it, four years, uh, eight periods, one every six months. You have a, a process where you get a 5% increase in pay every six months, and that, uh, that encourages you to get your schooling done, um, schooling is, uh, your classes are done uh, 160 hours for a carpenter, 200 hours a year for a millwright. That means that you come to school approximately once every 12, uh, 11 to 12 weeks is, is how that works out. The rest of the time you're available to work. If you're working, you're getting paid a negotiated wage with benefits. All right, going on. Who operates and benefits from apprenticeship programs? Private industry, single employers, groups of employ, uh, employers, group of empo uh, employers, cooperation with labor groups. And these programs typically provide, as you heard Desi say earlier, apprenticeship programs, 40 to $150,000 sc industry scholarships uh, at no cost or very little cost. Uh, what are the downside of these programs for business? It's the cost of starting a training program. Uh, you know, it would be very expensive to duplicate what we have here. However, it can be done. It doesn't have to be this elaborate. It can be simply a, a room that's been cleared out and, and uh, put together as an educational center. Um, one of the best uh, options is probably going to local community colleges. Community colleges are set up to do this type of training, uh, and they do it uh, the, the very cost effective. Um, for the apprentice, the downside is having to come to school. Uh, once they start to gain some skill and start to be employed on a regular basis, they don't like to come off the job to, go, to come to school. However, it's necessary. If you're going to survive in the industry, any industry today, you are going to have to keep up your career. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of teaching them how to budget their money so that they can take a week off and come to school. That's their skin in the game. They are not paid when they come to school. However, they do not pay anything. Also, for veterans, they can use their, their uh, GI benefits. There is no cost for the school. 
but they can use their benefits for uh, other expenses while they come to school. Industries that, that have programs, construction, manufacturing, telecommunication, information technology, service and retail, healthcare, the military actually, public utilities and the public sector. Here's, here's the nuts and bolts of this. Industrial safety and hygiene news set on June 11th of 2019. Baby boomers, look at the number of jobs held by baby boomers. And I fall into this group as well, 56 to 74 years old. Right now, 5 million construction workers are in that range. That means they are not going to be there much longer. Electricians, a half a million. Civil engineers, over a quarter of a million. Uh, machinists, uh, you know, two thirds of a million, or excuse me, a uh, little over a third of a million. Um, welding, almost a half a million. It just, it look at the numbers, and by some accounts, nearly a half a million more jobs in the skilled trades and workers as it sits right now, and that number is expected to rise to 2 million in the next 10 years. I would encourage you, if you're looking for a career, look for a career that has a 10-year projected increase in the, the number of people needed. So why are there not more apprenticeship programs? Why is college given as the only option? In carpentry, we have a saying, if you only have one tool in your toolbox, uh, if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. In education, educators typically go to college, they come out of college and they go right back to school to teach. Uh, and with that, the, the career path they talk about is going to college, I understand that. Um, and again, I'm not knocking college, I have two college degrees. However, uh, before I had a college degree, I was an ASC certified master technician uh, in the automotive field and, and I absolutely love that. And to this day, that's still my, uh, that's still my uh, pride and joy thing that I love to do the most. Um, let's talk about college enrollment, historical college enrollment from the 1970s to, the, to uh, 2018 when the last statistics were available educators, we said go and they went and they did exactly what we asked them to do. You want to have a good career, you want to make a good living, go to college, they went to college. But there's a disconnect between workers looking for good paying careers and educational opportunities to acquire those skills found in those careers. In other words, we have the need and we have the, uh, have the education, uh, educational opportunities, but for some reason we're not connecting. Many young people attend college for many reasons, including a lack of options. They bought into the only way, uh, the, bought into to believing the only way to make a living was to go to high school, go to college, and while college is the way, it's not the only way. Almost every college, get, uh, almost every day, one of our seven training centers um, receives an application from somebody with a college uh, degree, and when I talk to them, almost every one of them is because they can't pay back their debt. They're, they're deep in debt, and with the job they were able to find, they are not able to pay that debt off. Add to that to the price of college. It's increasing almost eight times faster than wages. When you compare college to the 1970s to today, um, the, the cost is insurmountable almost. It's, it's putting a heavy burden on parents, and look what it's doing in this country College debt outsurpassed credit card debt for the first time in our history last year. Um, that speaks volumes about where we are with student loan debt. Annual wages, and this is one of those dirty little secrets that you should know. If you're thinking about going to college, if you're not going to be in the top of the class, this study found that the annual wages for the bottom 25 percentile of college, graduate, of college graduates are less than the medium average of the medium wages earned by a typical worker with a high school diploma. So what this study said was, you go to school for four years, you acquire a lot of debt. If you graduate in the bottom quarter of that class, you are going to probably earn less than a high school graduate with no college. You know, if I came out of there with 60 or $80,000 worth of debt and made less than a, a college graduate, I'd probably be, pretty upset. The other problem is underemployment of college, of college graduates. So here's a report that was released, uh, released in July 29 of 2020. If you get a criminal justice degree, 73.2% of those in this study were underemployed. Performing arts, 63%, leisure and hospitality. Look at, 
look at the numbers and then figure out whether those are areas you want to spend money getting a degree in um, if in fact those numbers are true. Here's another scary thought, parents out there especially. 50% of millennials are moving back home with their parents after college. A new survey from TD Ameritrade says that 50% of young millennials plan to move back home with their parents after college. The shocking statistic is from a larger survey, the boomerang generation, and it's again, mostly contributed to the, to the student debt. That's you know, 100,000, 120,000 that, that Desi Holmes talked about at the beginning of this should be your first home should not be your college debt. So in summary, we've got more participation in secondary education. High school students are attending post-secondary education at rates higher than ever before. Higher rates of uh, unemployment or underemployment for, the, for those attending post-secondary school. Greater school loan cost and debt and greater need for skilled trained workers. This is not an indictment on post-secondary education, but it does beg the question, do we need to do something different? The challenge here is to find the right career for the right student, find the right, uh, the right uh, education and training, excuse me, right education and training and make sure it's cost effective for the student. Encouraging numbers are that we're up 128% in our apprenticeship counts for uh, this last year, which is fantastic. Um, however, you know, Desi said uh, we're up to 20,000 Apprentice in Texas, that's great, but we're a state of 29 million people. This country has approximately 6% of its population in apprenticeship programs. If you were to go overseas in Germany, it's 65% of everybody is being trained by an apprenticeship program. Um, go to France, go to England, you're in the high 50% of the public is trained through apprenticeship training. So we're considerably behind on the, the concept. Um, but we are starting to, to catch on a little bit. Lastly, for career seekers, what we need are opportunities for advancement, similar to master's degrees or doctor degrees. Um, that means providing in our industry foreman training so that once they've become a journeyman, got a few years of experience, if they want to move up and, uh, and run other people, and then last superintendent training, uh, if they want to reach that pinnacle before they may want to go on and do a uh, entrepreneurship, and that is own their own company. All right, that's the end of that presentation. And uh, now I'd like to just take you on a, a walk down the hall as we go to uh, go into the classroom where I told you we would have some people in there that uh, be glad to answer questions, talk to you. I got to get my volume up here. Do, 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 do. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, so our hallways here, we have seven classrooms in this building. Right now, I think most of the people are out in the shop. Um, however, I, uh, I'm gonna walk you into to the classroom where they're expecting us. Again, not everybody's out in the shop. We see some people in that classroom. That's one of our Millerite classes going on today. So let me step in here. Eric? Eric? All right. So, all right. So let me introduce you. As I told you all earlier, we were, we were coming in to do a, a Presentation. We're part of a pre you're part of a presentation. Um, are there any questions? As I said before, the six gentlemen in here that are going through an evaluation process to uh, see if this is the right career for them. And then also in the back, I have one journeyman who, well, one almost journeyman, one more class away after this one, correct, Chris? And uh, and he'll be a journeyman. So questions? Well, David, I have one. Um, sure. why ask one of them, it doesn't matter. Uh, why did they choose to go this route and why did they choose this particular field? Who wants to take that? All right. Uh, the reason I took this field because I was more, uh, 
the reason I took the skill is because I was more hands-on person, and uh, I can't really stay still to do schoolwork, so <laughs> be able to uh, learn how to do it more, you know, visualize and be hands-on is something I was caught on to real quick than just being in the books. Um, and I always like to see how the product, you know, we, what we start with and then to what we finish, how uh, satisfying it looks just to complete the project we do. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, let me just ask, well, let's see if anybody types in age range in here. Who's 20 years old or under? Who's 20 to 25? 25 to 30. All right, back there in the back, the old guy. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Well, I have one. What, if, you know, in turn, David, you mentioned the pay and it, the, the gradual payment every six months. Um, how does that fit in with their, their home life and their living and how often you know, they talk about going to school and then going to work. Um, is there enough time for both or do they feel cramped or how have they adjusted? Did, did you hear the question, Chris? Since you're the one making a living. Right. Uh, I believe the question was, uh, how does going to school while working fit into your home life? And the pay raises. Oh, and the pay raises. Um, so, Obviously, you have to have, I have, a, I have a spouse and they have to be understanding because uh, our job has the potential of travel. Um, and in some situations, that's where you make your money. Uh, otherwise, you may be without work for a period of time. Um, but uh, between hours and classes is, is your uh, avenue for pay raises. So how, how, how did I answer your, did, did that answer, I guess? Yes, it does. And I guess my, my a follow-up question to that is, um, deals with financial planning. Did you plan early on or did you get into a situation where you had to say, oops, I need to rethink how I'm spending? Um, so, uh, between my wife and I, we're pretty fastidious um, and, and also uh, frugal to, to an extent. But I've, I've definitely talked to people that had to rethink their, their situation and um, uh, live within their means a little more, if you will, uh, because it does, there are ebb, ebbs and flows. Um, so when turnaround season happens, if, if you're one of those type of hands, uh, you're going to be you're going to be killing it in the money, but there are there are dry spells, uh, and and especially early on in your career, there's going to be dry spells. Uh, so yes, it's it it would behoove you to to think uh, linearly. And and Sally K. Chris is Chris comes to us. Uh, like I said, he's just now finishing his four year apprenticeship program, but. You want to tell them what your college degree is in? Oh yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> so, so I have a degree uh, in biochem, which I got a job after college, uh, which took me to California. And the, it's obviously expensive to live in California. And when you start out in an industry, even with a degree, uh, you're you're making a little more money than the average person, but also you have uh, excessive financial debt, uh, and then coupled with living in a uh, uh, a state that's expensive uh, as as California, um, this was a better avenue, and I was able to pay my my college debt faster than I was. But you know, obviously, again, coupled with the cost of living here versus there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did any of the others come from doing a different kind of work to decide that they needed to come, you know, to do something like this apprenticeship? I came from uh, doing a lot of warehouse work. Um, 
I also cut up there on the side as well. So, I mean, coming into this, I, it was just a career that I could always take with me no matter where I go. Uh, I can also apply to my own house if needed to or help somebody out that needs help with that type of work as well. So it always comes in handy to learn something like this along the way. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a question for David. Uh, I uh, am sitting here, a uh, classroom full of uh, sophomores and juniors in high school. What advice would you give to those uh, that are in high school and, and thinking about, uh, you know, attending an apprenticeship versus a traditional university? Who are we asking that question to? Yeah, just to any of the students there. So this gentleman is a is an educator. He's got a classroom full of sophomores and he's wondering what advice, correct me if I'm wrong, you wanna know what advice you'd give to students when looking for a career for an apprenticeship program? Yes? Anybody wanna take that? Looking for, all right. Um, if you really don't want to be in debt school or if you just want to jump straight into the workforce, it's like the best thing for that. Anybody else? Um, doing something like this as, as well. Uh, they, they help you out with school. It's like no cost as long as you keep working and everything. So really school is free here. Compared to college, you pay ten thousand years. Compared to here, you pay no thousand. So all the money when you're earning, you can put away or do little projects at your home with the money you earn too as well. So for if you're trying to avoid debt and school's not for you, I would commit, uh, consider doing this type of work. Any other questions, Sally Kay? I don't see any in the chat. Oh wait, here's one. Um, oh no, this one just says, be sure to feel free to ask questions in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we don't well, like... have any in the chat and I'm sure, you know, some of the classrooms that we have, they may think of something later and let me share with the, their instructors that, um, as we move on for the afternoon, if you do come up with questions later on from your students, please get them to us and we will get them answered and sent back to you. Absolutely. Well, with that, we're going to end our presentation and let TD Industries, I think, is next. Yes? You're not going to show us the warehouse? Well, if you would like to, I know we've run, we've run over our time a little bit. No, um, you haven't. You can keep, you've got about nine more minutes. Oh, I do. Yes. Well, in that case, absolutely I want to. So again, some more going on in in the classrooms. Um, we do have a computer lab here as well. But when you come to school here, you're going to learn an industry-based and receive industry-based certifications. Um, you saw some of this in the, the video that the students did a couple of years ago. We've added equipment since then. Uh, on the Millwright side, it's more mechanical. And so you're going to learn a mechanical trade, um, but it is a precision mechanic. Um, you are going to be working with extremely expensive pieces of equipment that require a high degree of efficiency. And, uh, and the cost of the equipment is, is staggering. I wanna show you one piece that we just recently acquired. These are the turbine blades out of a small uh, gas-fired turbine. That one piece you're looking at, between $975,000 and $1.2 million, and that's just one piece of a small turbine. Why do they pay so well? Because the equipment costs so much. So in this, uh, in this area, you see an awful lot of equipment that we train on, teach you, you don't have to know anything when you come in, we'll teach it all to you. On the carpenter side, we do an awful lot of scaffolding. 
Um, we have a special three-year apprenticeship program just for scaffolding. And in this program, you're going to learn all different types. It may look the same, but all of this scaffolding is different. These are different systems. And you're gonna learn how to put them all together. You're gonna to learn how to do it safely. And uh, you're gonna learn all the safety that goes with that. Back there in the back are all the harnesses. You'll learn how to harness yourself. You'll learn how to tie off. Um, we want you going home every night safely. We'll teach you how to work in confined spaces. Um, this is a mock-up of a, uh, of a of actual work that we do working inside, uh, working inside tanks and systems. Different scaffold here on the inside of this tank than what we have on the outside of this tank. And again, that's to train you on the different uh, systems that are available. As carpenters, we also do a lot of uh, interior work. And again, we're commercial and industrial, so we don't do a lot of residential. On the commercial side, we have a special training. I know you heard Desi talk about uh, a special program for people who work with the gases inside a hospital. We have a special program that we teach how to go in and do uh, construction inside a hospital. We call it ICRA. Infectious Control Risk Assessment. Every hospital has to have an infection preventionist in the hospital. In order to necessitate the training of that, we built this 3,000 square foot mock-up of a hospital. Um, this piece of equipment you're looking at through the door, this is a HEP cart. This is a $10,000 piece of equipment that's used in hospitals to change out ceiling tiles or to pull cable through ceilings in work um, in places where you may have patients with compromised immune systems. We have this waiting area here, a nurse's station in here so that we can practice our trade. Um, as we go down the hallways here, you'll see we have a couple of patient rooms. Here's a temporary barrier we've built. There's our patient rooms in there. Um, the temporary barrier is here to protect the patients. If we were doing work out here in the hallway, I'm going to show back down this hallway. We teach how to build using the newest materials uh, to create temporary barriers. We show how to do that using a drywall system with a temporary barrier in these exam rooms. And then also, again, other temporary barriers for, uh, for exam rooms. We also teach you how to create negative air pressure so that we are always pulling contaminants to the, to the area where the HEPA filter, which is a, a high efficiency particulate machine is working. We do a lot of interior system metal stud framing. We don't do much with wood here other than beginning classes, but we teach you how to build with metal stud frames. This is what holds most schools together, most commercial buildings together. Um, you'll start with the metal stud framing and then you'll go on and do the sheet rocking afterwards. So lots of metal stud framing in this building. We teach you how to hang commercial doors um, and how to do the work with commercial doors. All of these doors are fitted with blanks. So you can, you can do the work on the door. When you finish, we pull off the blank, throw the blank away. We teach- David, we have a question in the chat. Sure. And it says, once you enroll and are accepted, how soon are you employed? Um, we typically try not to bring you in until we have a need. You know, again, I, I probably have over 100 applications sitting uh, idle right now just for Houston. And the reason is the work slowed down because of COVID. We're expecting that to break open. You know, mm -hmm. each month it looks like it's put off to next month. But Mostly people are saying till after the first of the year, but we try to bring you in when there's a need. So you're going to work fairly quickly. Now there are some cases where someone will say, you know what, I understand there's no work, but I'd like to come in and start getting my training now so that I'm ready when the work does start. And we take that under consideration as well. But we want you to go to work, you know, in order to stay in the program, it's great that it's paid for, but if you're not earning any money, that doesn't do you any good either. Um, in this space that you see, we just built this. We just finished building this. Inside these crates over here, there's a $40,000 pharmacy room. Um, 
There is work starting here in Houston where they have to have clean rooms. This is specifically for the uh, pharmacy industry. In the next two weeks, that'll be assembled over on that pad and it'll be a completely enclosed, uh, dust-free environment for producing pharmacy products. And so that's a new line for us, something that we're just now starting. So well, David, that, this is this is a fantastic tour, and I'm sure not just the high school students appreciate seeing it, um, but so do every so does everyone else on this webinar. And I appreciate seeing so much of what's been added since I was in there a year ago. So thank you very very much for this presentation. Are there any final questions of David this afternoon? Well, I just see a great pres a comment, which is a great presentation, and I'm sure we all agree with that. Um, thank you so much, David, and um, I look forward to seeing you in the near future. I, I look forward to it as well, Dr. James. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you for your time today, and enjoy the rest of the, of the afternoon. Okay, thank you. And now we'll move on to, <clears throat> excuse me, TD Industries. And our presenters are uh, Mark jo uh, Joseph, who is the Talent Acquisition Program Manager, and Wayburn Henry, who is the Scheduling Manager. Good Mark afternoon. and Wayburn, there yeah, you go. How are you? I'm fine. How are you doing? Great. Can I take the screen? You've got the screen. All right. Let me get set up here. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Mark Joseph with TD Industries. And um, uh, along with me is my partner, Wayburn Henry, who actually sits in the Houston office. I'm in the Dallas area. We appreciate you guys allowing us the opportunity to be here with you today. Let me say that first, David, in the future, we got to go before you because you're a hard act to follow. I made notes, okay, from your presentation. And one thing I don't want is my millennials returning home. <laughs> so um, with that, I'll go ahead and get started. And we're going to talk to you about apprenticeships within TD Industries. We like to call that a journey to success. Um, and of course, providing opportunities for future careers, right? Uh, long-term stability and, and growth and development. I'm going to quickly roll through these slides to get to what I like to call the good stuff, which is where Wayburn comes in to actually talk about the apprenticeship. So this information I'm giving you is more about TD Industries itself. We couldn't talk about that without giving you a little history on TD Industries. Um, the company has been serving the Texas market since 1946. I um, started with our C founding CEO, Jack Lowe Sr., um, who opened the company just as an AC distribution company in the back of his aunt's auto parts store. Um, and that was headquartered in Dallas. So starting way back then with that vision, we've evolved to over 2,800s in multiple locations with a revenue of 700 million and a goal by 2025 to hit actually um, 1 billion in revenue. So what does that mean to... Uh, in, individuals outside of TD and within and partners within TD. It means a lot of opportunity, opportunity for growth, opportunity for new jobs and um, to, to reach that goal, we got to get new business, which means we got to get new partners to support that business. Um, TD was also founded on or it, we're, we're based on the principles and, and core values of leading with the servant's heart. Uh, we Safety is right up there at the top of our core values as well. Celebrating individual differences, passionately pursuing excellence, and building and maintaining trusting relationships. Without having relationships, this company would have not have been able to sustain for 75 years. So we are approaching our 75th year in business, um, which is pretty amazing. And with TD, we are a mechanical contractor. So that means that we're in charge of the heating, the cooling systems, the refrigeration, the piping and plumbing. That's our focus, uh, Focus, but we do offer uh, full life cycle solutions in terms of construction, uh, the commercial construction. So planning, design, facilities management, energy solutions, automated, uh, automation, controls, fire life safety, 
um, MEP engineering and design, truck-based mechanical and electrical services and facilities management and operations. We also have what's called process solutions and multifamily construction divisions. So um, by doing so, we've been able to, you know, in the uh, when you think about business, think about it continuing to change different economic climates and, and business is cyclical. So it goes up and goes down. So by us having multiple pieces of the pie, multiple streams of income with these different businesses, we're able to continue to keep our partners uh, working, keep their families fed, to keep the business going and continue to grow. Let's see. It's moving slowly. Uh, just to share with you some of the projects that we've had over the past uh, 10 years. Globe Life Field, which is where the uh, Dodgers recently won the World Series, but we finished that project in Dallas, in the Dallas area just recently, um, as well as the AT&T Stadium, the Mer Mercedes-Benz Stadium, which was formerly the called the Falcon Stadium, Stadium in Atlanta. Um, we went to Phoenix to participate in the building of the Phoenix Cardinal Stadium, which is now the University of Phoenix. And that was back in 2003. So we actually opened an office based on the relationships that we established there. And now that, that location is about 400 partners strong. Um, the Dickies Arena we recently completed. Uh, Wayborn, you wanna weigh in on some of the projects we have had in the Houston area? Can't hear you. You're on mute. I think those are our famous words nowadays. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're doing a lot of hospitals right now. Uh, we've done Memorial Hermann, uh, a couple of their towers. Uh, MD Anderson, we're doing a couple of their towers. Um, what else? Uh, we've done some remodels to the... Um, uh, the Astro Stadium. Um, actually, they just wherever Torchy's Tacos. If you've ever been there, we were part of that that remodel. And there's a new part that actually hasn't been revealed yet, but you'll see it when you go next time you go in. Um, what else? Uh, we we do facilities at the George R. Brown Convention Center, uh, which means we are there 24/7 uh, maintaining their HVAC, plumbing, and electrical needs. And that's my, that's my list for now. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, you know, something to note is that over the past 10 years, we've done about 427,000 in K through 12 higher education work um, projects as also our healthcare and hospitals has been over 18, uh, 819 million in, in that area, multifamily, commercial, hospitality, industrial, and entertainment work. Um, those are between 469 million and 930 million for those two different um, areas. So we've um, been able to participate in some major, major projects. TD Industries has seven key market, uh, seven key markets from our headquarters in Dallas to Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and Fort Worth, and then jump over to Phoenix, where we have a uh, major office there, and then two satellite office uh, satellite locations: one in Yuma, one in um, uh, Tucson, Arizona, and then Denver is where our multifamily division has actually expanded to as well. So that means that our opportunities and apprenticeships aren't just in the Houston area, but they are in multiple locations throughout Texas and um, Arizona. With TD Industries, we are committed to providing outstanding career opportunities. I'm not going to run the video, but just to give you um, a little insight there, we we like to say we give you the tools to build your career. And by that, we mean we are focused on the whole person. TD Industries being a company that is a servant, is based on servant leadership, our leaders actually um, support the team versus the people within the team are the partners completely just looking out for the leaders. So focused on their development, focuses, focused on their training. We want to make sure that our partners within TD Industries are able to achieve the goals that they've set forth in terms of building their career. Um, so 
continuous improvement. We have learning management systems, uh, a learning management system with over 900 actual learning modules and as well as our PDF. So and they, you could pick up and learn anything from a technical training, like something about plumbing to maybe even soft skills like negotiations or communication. Um, all of that is, is available to our TD partners in addition to support for licenses and certifications that they may want to accomplish. Now to talk about our careers in construction, I am going to <coughs> pass it over to um, Wayburn. All right, um, glad to be here. So just to talk about our trades a little bit, uh, over at here at TD, we, uh, Mark mentioned that we're mechanical contractors. So we install plumbing systems, piping systems and uh, sheet metal, um, but we also do facilities and service work. Um, so the uh the plumbers obviously are putting in anything from restrooms um sinks um anything in the bathroom and we're commercial only not residential uh so you're not dealing with most of the time or you're not dealing with waste because it's, you're putting the you're the first person to test the plumbing systems on our new construction side and um on the special project side it's typically uh it's, it's typically new construction but it's on a smaller scale uh, they're expanding a building or something like that. Um, our uh, piping, pipe fitters, that is where, that's where the welding is. And that is where our heating and cooling of a building comes from, the piping side of it. Um, and then our sheet metal side is how the air flows through the building. Uh, if you've ever looked the, above a ceiling grid, which unless the ceiling grid wasn't there, you probably haven't seen it, but there's duct work that runs through a, through a building and that is how our, that's how the air gets through uh, from the AC unit and outside air and things like that. Um, the facility service, uh, that's always going to be a need, especially in Houston, because I, I don't know if you've ever been in a house without AC in Houston, but it's, it's not a, it's not pleasant mm -hmm. and, or a building without air. Uh, so that, that's one positive thing about our industry is that, there's always going to be a need, um, you know, is there, if we're just think about COVID, we've been uh, basically in our homes or in seclusion in a sense with uh, minimal outside activity and you're, you prefer to be out, you know, indoors with some AC and not with the heat. Um, and then with you being inside, you're probably eating more. So you're utilizing your plumbing services a little more. So, um, there's definitely uh, there's definitely different career opportunities with us. As an apprentice, you would come in and uh, plumbing plumbing apprentices uh, they have to register uh, with the state uh, to get a plumbing apprentice license, which will help you take care of that. Um, and typically, start our apprentices around 17 uh, with no experience, and you'll progress. Uh, we do we do look at pay uh, twice a year, and um, basically what they look at is, you know, what type of trainings are you participating in? Are you progressing? Um, I think David mentioned it earlier. You're not going to get away from math because uh, our pipe fitters, they use a lot of math. Um, reading, it's, you may not have to do the reading as an apprentice, but part of the job, you have to make sure you're reading the, the specifications for the job to make sure you're installing everything properly. Um, we have our, uh, Mark just pulled up our learning map. So you're gonna see the different progression. There's different trainings uh, for each level. We have plumbing posted here, but just like plumbing, we have uh, sheet metal and piping apprentice uh, learning maps. We, uh, we actually just launched a new uh, apprenticeship program where oh, I should mention that we are a registered uh, DOL apprenticeship, um, but we just, we just launched a new program where it's gonna, it's gonna be an apprenticeship program slash mentorship. Uh, we're going to basically kind of assess where you are um, coming in green. You won't have any experience. So down the line, you would, we would assess the skills that you you've gathered uh, and then figure out what, what else is needed. And you'll have a mentor assigned to you to help you to grow. Uh, so you're not going to stay stagnant. We have uh, two, two examples that I like to use. Uh, we have two individuals that came in straight out of high school. Um, they both, well, three, really, they, they said they didn't want to go to college. Um, and one of them is a basically a project superintendent 
which project superintendents make anywhere around, I think, 60 to 95,000 a year. Uh, and he's he's not on the low end of that. So um, that's that's something to look forward to. I think he, he's been with the company about 10 years. So, you know, coming out of high school, probably around what, 18, so 28, and you're making, you know, 80 to 90. Uh, that's pretty solid. Um, and then um, we have two plumbing apprentices right now that came from various programs in the Houston area, high schools. And uh, one of them has, one of them decided after he came with us that he does want to do college. And it, it was mentioned about college debt. We're paying for his school. Um, he's, he's going to, he's got his basics done. And I think he's going to go to university of Houston to get his bachelor's in construction, uh, construction science. And that's being paid for by our TV industries. Um, and then we have, uh, we have the other apprentice who he's probably making close to 50,000 a year. Um, and he, you know, he, he wants to just progress in the field and become a superintendent. So we we have him going the necessary route to achieve that. Uh, you can go to the next one. That's more of the learning maps. Um, so here's the the levels, um, and uh, I can run through these real quick. The so the apprentice level is what you would come in at, um, and for plumbing, it'll be at least four years uh, before you'd be moving to a journeyman role. Uh, for sheet metal and piping, it'll be roughly three years, uh, just depending on how fast you learn and um, the different things that we require for you to be exposed to in, uh, in the field. Um, safety is a huge part of promotions. We can't promote unsafe people. So um, just think about that, you know, just remember that, keep that in mind. Um, foreman, our foreman, uh, they make anywhere from 60 to, uh, oh, sorry, like 40, it's like 45 to 75, I think is the, the range. So, uh, that's not including overtime and incentives. So once you get to that foreman level, everything after that, there's incentives tied into your, their pay. Uh, and some of the, some of the departments actually provide trucks for the foreman. So, um, it could be in a company truck. So hopefully your driving records are intact. <laughs> um, and uh, then you got project superintendent. That's somebody that is uh, almost a superintendent step. They're running the job. They're not really on their tools as much. Um, the superintendent is running all trades on a, on a job site. Uh, they meet with the general contractors, uh, learn, you know, discuss our updates and, and make sure everybody's lined out and we're performing to uh, peak performance. And then a uh, production manager basically manages the field. Uh, they're over the superintendent and the field partners. So um, they'll, and the production managers make, I would say, 130 to $170,000 a year, somewhere around there. Uh, superintendents around that $100,000 $100, a year range. And I yeah, saw so a question. Was there a question? Yes. Yeah, there's a question on here. Yes, the question our is, are y'all registered with DOL? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Uh, all, all three of our trades are registered with the DOL. Um, and now we're at the what TD Industries looks for. So coming out of high school, I mean, we just – character is a huge part of our company. So, you know, somebody that has good standards and – good work ethic, um, shows up on time to work, you know, take pride in what you do. Um, uh, we, we don't encourage you to have your phones on site, but you know, it's some people like to, you know, take pictures of what they've done, um, because they put it in so good that they, they want to be able to show their families. Uh, that's, that's a huge, uh, that's a huge thing from our field is they like to be able to drive by a building and say, Hey, I built that. Um, and that's, that's a, a reason why you would want to be a part of this. I mean, it's a it's a great industry that, to be honest, I didn't know much about it when I was in high school. So um, this is actually, you know, good that you guys are taking a part of this so you can learn about different opportunities. 
Yeah, um, in my two years of being with TD Industries, I've learned so much about commercial construction. I just, you don't know what you don't know. Um, I will mention that employ, employability skills and work readiness skills, or we'll say the lack thereof in young people has been a hot topic as of late. And, you know, what's Wayburn, would you say is one of the quickest ways to lose a job at a job site? Um, for a partner or somebody that's working at a job site? Not wearing your safety glasses or working without your hard hat. Some, something safety related, that's, that's pretty quick. Um, you know, on your cell phone, I mean, you have this time, there's opportunities for breaks. Uh, when you're at work, you're supposed to be working. So um, that's, I would say those are quick ways to, to uh, be terminated pretty quick. I, I did want to correct myself i did i think i mentioned a gender specific we do have women in the field uh so it is men and women uh we we do pride ourselves in hiring both in our in our field and continue to grow that that number yeah uh, in fact we have a strong initiative to increase our females in the trades for any that are listening right now um so with td we we look at the the whole person, especially when we're talking about young talent. We know that they aren't coming to the table with a whole lot of experience, but if they can bring those characters and those um, those core values that we relate to, so safety, having good attendance, the ability to follow instructions and respond well to supervision, being dependable, trustworthy. Communication is extremely important when you're talking about construction projects, communication and teamwork, organization and management, critical thinking, problem solving, just having good old common sense, being hardworking and job focused. Those are those attributes that will get you a job sooner than being that star player with a bad attitude and doesn't show up. Um, so those are what we look for. We know that we can train on the technical aspect, but there are some things that you just, some values that you just have to have to have. So we look for that great cultural fit as well. And what do we offer? One, one of the things that I want to just really point out, um, the, the apprenticeships is all about training and development and growth. And for us within TD, it is continuous training and growth opportunities that we offer. Um, it, we provide that tuition assistance and we do 100% paid craft training. So it's a earn while you learn type of thing. It saves money and makes money. Any questions that anybody has for us? There's one in the chat. Uh, yes, we do do drug screens and uh, background checks. Um, just a standard drug screen and background. And there's typically, there may be some additional background checks that for a specific job site, but obviously if you if you clear our uh, background, then we would put you on a different site if you aren't able to go to you know the site that we ran the badging on. Yeah, so having a good background is very very cool. helpful, and you continuing to um, progress in your career. Um, so not just having it when you get the job, but maintaining it after you get the job is extremely important, right? So you don't want to get into a situation where you're going to put your own blocks up. Um, so we are one of those companies that looks at every individual as a case by case basis. So there are some situations that will not allow you to be eligible for employment with TD, but many will. Any other questions? There's another one. starting pay. Um, so starting pay uh, typically started one at 17 in Houston. Uh, if you're an apprentice, and but that's not, yeah, 17 is typically what we started. Yeah, yeah, and um, you, TD also sees value in, in value in internships, and we've started to have high school interns. We are just about to move that over to our Houston market. So ideally, we'd love for a high school student to start with us as an intern and then continue to progress, come to us during the summer or come to us during the practicum period so that we can do practicum, uh, tie that into a pre-apprenticeship, then move that after they graduate from high school and have spent a couple of summers with us and a couple of practicum periods with us, um, they'll take those hours over to our uh, apprenticeship and continue their progression. 
So we are actually working on that for Houston. We have that for some of our other locations. And here is how you can contact us, take a look at our positions, learn more about our company, connect with us on social media. There's a question about requirements for our high school internships. High school interns need to be at least 16, um, preferably enrolled in a technical uh, trade program, something like construction trades, welding, um, some of the other ones. Um, there are some HVAC classes, carpentry. plumbing classes, carpentry classes. So any of those are considerations for our internship. But also we highly value the recommendations of instructors, your teachers, their they spend the time with um, the students. They know, you know, if they get to know TD, they'll know if their student is a good fit for TD industries or not, or if we're a good fit for that student as well. So we, we look at the recommendations of um, the teachers. Any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat, but I want to thank you and uh, both Mark and Wavern for a very informative presentation today. And I, I, I feel confident that you're going to be getting some inquiries from some of these high schools about that high school internship. And, and I know there are some people that are hoping you'll get it set up for this summer. Absolutely. Yeah. What I'll do is go ahead and drop my uh, contact information in the chat and Wayburn can do the same um, and we can connect individually. That would be terrific because I know we have quite a few high school um, teachers uh, registered and, and in today listening to what you all have to say. And I know their students, you know, are probably sitting there with big eyes and 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 hopeful uh, that they can be part of that in the future. So thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today and um, your presentation. It, it, it is valued by all. And so thank you very much. And thank you. Thanks for having us. As the facilitator of this committee, I'm really appreciative that, that you are part of it now. So thank you. Thank we you. are excited thank to be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Okay. So before we end today, what I would like to do is just remind you that there won't be any um, apprenticeship companies uh, with us tomorrow, but what will be presented tomorrow will be the programs that six community colleges in the Houston area uh, work with. Um, the presentations are really gonna be informative. It will help you in whatever uh, area that you may be in and what community college you relate to. Um, even if you're not near one of these community colleges, um, it will hopefully give you some ideas to work with your ISDs and that and a community college nearby. We, any one of us from a community college on this committee are anxious for apprenticeships to be expanded across the whole Houston area. So um, please stay tuned uh, to hear from the community colleges tomorrow. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.